First of all, can everyone hear me? So am I coming through the mic okay? Okay, so we're good. All right, so how's everyone doing today? Oh. Okay, both of you are doing good, that's good. Glad everyone's enthusiastic this morning. Glad to see you. Well, <clears throat> see I always do that test in the beginning when I, uh, when I, when I uh, start up. And I think, you know, if, if everyone's not gonna be enthusiastic, what we need to do is we need to start with a quiz. How do you feel about that? Does that sound okay? Jack, would you help me pass these around? Okay. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pass these around, but they're gonna go face down. You got it? Face down. Okay. All right. Yep. So we're gonna go face down. What do I do if I catch a peek and run? Well, then they're gonna be in trouble. How many more do you need? Oh, two more. Just more. Are we grading these wrong? What's that? Are we grading these? Absolutely. There's always a grade that you should know that when you go to conferences and you go to, uh, to meetings that there's, there's absolutely always going to be some kind of a grading system. So, um, so anyway, I don't know how long it's been uh, since you've all been in school. By the looks of some of you, it's been a really, really long time. So, uh, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to actually see how uh, we're going to actually see how well you do with this. All right. There we go. There we go. Okay, and I'm assume I'm going to assume that everyone here has a pencil or a pen, right? Does everyone have a? You need one of these. Okay, you have to participate as well. Okay, raise your hand if you did not get a quiz. One of my favorite things to do is uh, charge people financially when phones ring. That, I'm just kidding, mostly. Okay, all right, so, okay, so here's how this works, all right? So when I was in school, I went to a small school, okay? Um, and, uh, and then when I went to the University of Wyoming, I discovered that really the best way for me to do well in school was to sit behind the smart, the smart people, okay? We're not gonna play that game today, okay? So, <clears throat> I don't want you cheating off of your neighbor, okay? So eyes on your own paper. I'm gonna give you about two minutes to do this. And you may flip over and start now. All right. And time. Okay, down with the pens. How did, how did you do? Is everyone feeling real confident and assured of themselves already this morning? <clears throat> wow, you guys are less enthusiastic than when we started. <laughs> Maybe we need to have more reports. <laughs> right? All right, well, okay, so I'm going to call on some people. I'm going to call on our friend Elliot first, okay? All right, so Elliot, tell me on which side of a cup is the best to have the handle? The right. How many people said the right side? Yeah, because, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm right-handed. How many people said the left side? Okay, come on, show me, the, show me the hands, all right? If you said the right or you said the left, you're wrong. Who said the outside? The, oh, the vertical side, huh? So, so there's two sides to a cylinder, right? There's the inside and the outside. There's no right or left, right? But if you're right-handed, that's automatically where you go to. All right. All right, Kevin. I mean, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> where did the biggest potatoes grow? My first answer that I would change is Idaho. Absolutely, because, because that's, I mean, everyone knows that potatoes are grown in Idaho, right? Who said Idaho? Come on, show a hand. Oh, whatever. I saw, like, that's what most everyone put, right? <laughs> that's wrong. Yeah, the biggest potatoes actually grow in the ground. Yeah, yeah, see? We got... So who's 100% so far? Excellent, all right. Okay, we're going to see if that changes. All right, so what living thing has only one foot? Who said a snail? You know, it doesn't matter where I go, everyone always says a snail. How many snails have you seen that have feet and legs and all that? Where'd 
you go to school? <laughs> Depends on where you went to school, right? All right. What living thing has only one foot? Does anyone else have any other answer besides a snail? I haven't seen too many of those walking around either. How about a leg? Right? A leg. A leg. Well, sure it is. Mine's living. <laughs> All right, number, number four. Would you rather <clears throat> a tiger attack you or a lion? Scott? A lion. Who said a lion? Okay, who said a tiger? Okay, so why did, why did you choose that? Lion will just, kill you faster. Oh, 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 a lion will kill you faster? Okay, <laughs> let me read the question, okay? Would you rather a tiger attack you or a lion? <laughs> That's all there is to it, right? <laughs> Oh man, hey, I'm telling I you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where where are this is for the ladies in the group. Okay? You're a you're a little bit of a minority today. Where are all men equally good looking? This is easy. In their minds. In their minds. <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> Who said in the dark? See, there's an honest man right there. The answer is in the dark. Right? All right. So, if it took eight men ten hours to build a wall, how long would it take four men to build that wall? Okay, we're getting into math, so it depends on where you went to school, whether you can, uh, whether you can get the proper answer here. Did we come up with a good answer? 20 hours? 20, who said 20 hours? Good man. I'd say no time at all because the wall's already built. <laughs> Did you get that one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Moving right along. Okay. Which would you prefer to have? This is a money question here, okay? So you need to be good at math with this one. Okay. Which would you prefer to have? An old $10 bill or a new one? Both. Both. Right. I love it when you give people a choice. That's, that's like my kindergarten. He says, you know, do you, would you rather have mac, or che mac and cheese or, you know, chicken nuggets? Oh, I'll have both. That, that's, that's not an option. I didn't ask you if you wanted both. I asked you if you wanted mac and cheese or chicken nuggets, right? So <clears throat> let me ask this question again. Which would you prefer to have, an old $10 bill or a new one? Well, sure, you'd like the old 10, right? Who wouldn't, okay? Even us people who aren't quite as good at math, we'd still like to have that old $10 bill, <laughs> wouldn't we? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so if you had three apples and four oranges in one hand and four apples and three oranges in the other hand, what would you have? Easy peasy, what's that? Two hands full? I think you just have really big hands. Really big hands, okay. All right, so how can a man go eight days without sleep? Farming. Farming? <laughs> I'm a little slow at handing my prizes out. See, I like that answer. There you go. There's your door prize. He sleeps at night. Right? Who got that? Did anyone get that? So I have no 100 percenters in the room? Rats. Man. Wait. <laughs> All right, let's go to the last one. This one will make you feel better because this is a math question. Okay. Jerry, are you ready? Okay. Divide 20 by a half and add 10. What is the answer? Divide 20 by 0.5 and add 10. It's 50. Good job. Good job. So no 100 percenters in the room then is what you're, uh, is what you're telling me. Okay? So 
How does that make you feel about yourself so far this morning? My college education did not pay off. <laughs> Dumber than boiled gravel. I've never heard that one before. Wow. <laughs> I think I want to go. I think I want to go home now. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> well, I, there, there's a point to all of this, and uh, I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. So my point isn't just only to make you feel really poorly about yourself. Although I do get a little bit of a thrill out of that. Okay, so, so as, uh, as the introduction said, uh, my name is Ron Rabo. I am from the wonderful, wonderful, beautiful state of Wyoming. How many people have been to Wyoming? All right, so how many people have been, who, who knows what this is? What's, what's that a picture of? Well, I know it's the mountains, but which mountains? Which mountains? It's the Tetons, right? Yellow, who's been to Yellowstone National Park? Okay, everyone's been up there. All right. So Wyoming's a, a beautiful state, you know. It's uh, uh, every time I tell people that I'm from Wyoming, their first response is, "I love it there. It's so beautiful." So <clears throat> this is uh, actually where I live. <laughs> That's my Wyoming. Okay, so the picture up above is the northwestern corner of Wyoming, and I live in the southeastern corner of Wyoming. So I think I kind of got ripped off a little bit. Like we were joking around last night, right, Jack, about the fact that, that my relatives at some point in time decided that they would leave the beautiful Midwest, which I think if anyone ever has that thought that you're completely crazy because I find it completely amazing here, and they decided that they would move west at one point. And when they moved west, they got here, and they said, this is great. Let's build a house. There's no trees. There's no water. The wind blows 1,000 miles an hour almost every day. I think we should live here and raise a family. Sounds like a great idea, right? Well, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's pretty interesting how my, uh, how my family ended up there. And I want to just take a little bit of time explaining to you and really just uh, uh, familiarizing you with who I am, where I came from, what my background is, who is this guy that, they, uh, that, that your organization had come here and, uh, uh, to speak. And so this is really what started all of it. And so the Homestead Act was passed on May 20th in 1862. Okay, and so what it was is it was an act, as many of you know, that was for the adult heads of families to get 160 acres of surveyed public land, and all they had to do is live on it continuously for five years and to farm it, all right? Except when they started to farm it, they realized that this was not the Midwest. So when you tear up the prairie in uh, our wonderful state of Wyoming, you find that maybe that wasn't such a good plan after all. So <clears throat> this article, so my, great, my grandfather was, uh, born in uh, 1913, and he saved a lot of newspaper articles from the early 1900s from his father. Uh, and so I have this massive area in my house full of all these totes that are full of, of uh, uh, newspaper articles and magazines and things like that from the early 1900s. And so I've learned a lot about my family and I've learned a lot about history just by going through that. So this particular article I thought was interesting because it was in the Wyoming Tribune on, on Monday, January 1st in 1917. They discovered that cultivation maybe was not such a good practice, so it wasn't required on 640 acre homesteads. So it says that residence is necessary, but claim holder may spend $1.25 an acre for improvements instead of farming the ground. Does that, that sounds like a pretty good deal, right? I remember my great grandfather talking about the fact that they had purchased land back in the early 1900s for 50 cents an acre. And they couldn't afford to hold on to it. So those were during the tough times. So many of you who have been to, how many of you have been to Cheyenne Frontier Days? I know Daryl has, okay? You've been to Cheyenne Frontier Days? So what'd you think? Yeah? It's, it's just a big, I mean, it's the largest outdoor rodeo celebration. And so, uh, I found this to be pretty interesting because a lot of people, especially when you go east, oddly enough, my mom's from Connecticut. So I spent a lot of time growing up going to the east coast. And when you tell people that you're from Wyoming, they literally think that you, that you live in a sod house, 
and that you have an outhouse that you go to the bathroom in, like still today. I mean, that's for real. And so, so I always like sharing this because this says, this is in the Cheyenne newspaper as well, and it says that the, uh, these are about the rowdy days in Cheyenne in 1867. So here's what I want to do. I want to read this because I find it really fascinating. So it says that when it was known that Cheyenne was to be the winter terminus of the Union Pacific in the winter of 1867 and 68, there was a grand hegira of roughs, gambling, and prostitutes from Julesburg. Of course, that's Julesburg, Colorado. Uh, and other places uh, down the road. Habitations sprang up like mushrooms. They were everywhere, every, of every conceivable character, from tent and log and lumber to dugouts. Shannon became known as Hell on Wheels. Town lots sold at fabulous prices. I love the old style writing. Every nation in the globe was represented and the principal pastime was gambling, drinking barbed wire lightning, and shooting. I have no idea what that means to drink barbed wire lightning. Does it, has anyone ever heard that term before? I need to figure out what that is. So, robbed for pleasure. Cheyenne had 6,000 inhabitants and the rougher element were stealing anything from anybody daily and nightly. Amusements were knockdowns and robberies. The more respectable residents got tired of those depredations on property and life and formed a vigilance committee. Judge Lynch held court from which there were neither appeals nor stays in execution. No gallows was erected because tele telegraph poles and the Crow Creek Bridge were of easy access. So can you imagine that? Like if you went and sold something in Cheyenne in the old days, that what you were going to do is you were going to just go out to the Crow Creek Bridge and they were going to hang you because they didn't like what you were doing there. So probably a lot of those people probably deserved that. So my history with this, my roots run pretty deep in Wyoming. They actually run all the way back to 1867. So my great, great grandparents migrated from the great city of Kearney, Nebraska. Oh yes, and they migrated west. And for the life of me, I still don't understand that it's not like Carnegie, or, or the, that Kearney is the, uh, the you know, farming mecca of the world either, right? It's the Sandhill Crane capital of the world. But when you go west of Kearney, the scenery doesn't change. If you've ever driven down, how many of you have ever driven down I-80 and gone west? It is brutal, isn't it? Like, especially when you get to Kearney, <laughs> and then you go west. So I can't imagine leaving that and thinking, wow, this is, you know, we're in a wagon. We've been in a wagon for weeks, and the scenery hasn't changed. Let's keep going, right? I mean, maybe well, there's no other option, right? So, so my family ended up landing in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, they, they uh, worked at the Cheyenne Steam Laundry, and they, they bought and sold real estate. And uh, my great great grandfather was a stonemason. This is a picture of the Union Pacific uh, building, the depot, that is still standing today. It looks almost, I mean, it looks exactly the same as that today, fully constructed. And uh, he was a stonemason and helped build that building and helped build the Wyoming State Capitol. Well, he died in the early 1900s, and my great great grandmother had always wanted to have a ranch. And uh, so she and her family moved east to Alvin. At the time, my great grandfather was a, uh, he was a, uh, a, a hack driver. So I don't know if you've ever heard the term hack, uh, but it's basically a taxi driver. So he would take people from F.E. Warren Air Force Base, which was outside of town, all the way into Cheyenne. And one of the people that he transported at one time was Tom Horn. So if any of you know the story about Tom Horn, he was the last man that was legally hung in the state of Wyoming. And there's still a great big controversy in our state about whether he actually committed the crime or not. And so he and my great-great-grandmother uh, decided that they would move east, northeast actually, of Cheyenne and homestead near the, what became the town of Alvin, Wyoming, metropolitan area of 120 people. So that's where I grew up. I grew up there on a cattle ranch. I grew up on a uh, family-owned cattle ranch. And so we had, unfortunately, not enough land and not enough cattle to really do well. So we owned uh, about 300 head of cattle, okay, in our operation, and there were four families that lived off of that. We farmed a little bit, and almost everything that we farmed went back to feed the cattle that we raised. So the most that I ever knew that my dad made when I was in school and when he was raising my sister and I, when he and my mom were raising my sister and I, was $600 a month. 
And so that was in the, in the, early, the late 80s and the early 90s. And so he still had, it wasn't like one of these ranches where all your expenses are, you know, taken care of. My parents still had to take care of all their expenses. So there was never enough money to go around. And so that created a little bit of a problem in our operation. See, it was my dad, my grandfather, and my grandfather's brother's sons that were on the operation. So what I tell people is that it was, it was the same family tree, but completely different branches. My dad was the hub of the operation, and he was the one that did all the management of everything. In fact, I remember his cousins and his father coming into our house every morning at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, watching our family eat breakfast and asking my dad what they needed to do that day. These are, these are guys in their 50s and 60s asking my dad what they need to do. Because there was, there was not much thought other than the fact that, you know, great grandfather, great grandfather moved here and then grandfather moved here. And if we just keep doing the same thing that they did, then everything will be okay. Because our model in our business when I grew up was don't worry about the revenue, just don't spend any money. And you'll make it. Everything will be okay. Because that's the way that great great grandfather did it. That's the way that great grandfather did it. So why change anything? And so I found myself in this, uh, in this predicament uh, of, of uh, growing up where we had this, uh, you know, this ranch that was really not big enough to go around. But there was a lot of history that went behind the ranch. This is one of my favorites. When my great grandfather built the ranch, he was, uh, uh, he was certainly a pioneer and uh, one that was fairly aggressive in building his property. And so there was, there was a lot of pride and family history in my family. And this is one of my favorites. It says, two farmers fight when one impounds 40 stray hogs. So Sydney, Nebraska, December 27th, and I don't know what year this was, but George Rago and Samuel Haldeman, farmers living in the Alvin district west of Kimball, were both injured in a fight caused by Haldeman impounding at his farm a drove of 40 hogs, which belonged to Rabo. Haldeman was hurt in the fistic encounter, and Rabo was confined to his home with gunshot wounds inflicted, according to police, by Haldeman after Rabo had beat him up. Raybo was shot in the leg and chest with a shotgun. Haldeman has been arrested, and Raybo will recover, according to advice he's had from his home Sunday. Right? Like, it's a total wild west. Like, where in the world, I mean, where am I living, right? I mean, this is, this is the world that I grew up in. And so, so with, with us, in our operation, there was a lot of pride in this family history. In fact, there was so much pride in the family history that change was not an option. Because I remember my dad talking to my grandpa about the fact of, you know, let's invest into a circle and put a, a center pit up on some of our land. Didn't want to spend the money. Okay. Now for 40 years, uh, almost, in our county, you haven't been able to drill a well. So if you didn't do it clear back in the 70s, it wasn't going to happen. Okay. And so on our operation, there was no debt, but there couldn't be because there was just no income. That's just the way it worked. And so... <clears throat> So I found, I found myself in a little bit of a uh, predicament when I was growing up because my dad and I would talk about ranch transition and, and farm transition. You all have been there before if you're, if you're in agriculture and you understand this stuff. I mean, history is important and family legacies are important and all of that. <clears throat> but I knew that when I was in school that I would have to go to college and get a job and work outside of the farm or outside of the ranch if I was ever going to have anything to do with it. And so that's what I did. And I found myself, uh, uh, I was pretty active in the FFA organization when I was growing up. I was a state FFA officer. I was on some national FFA staffs. And I ended up getting a job with the Wyoming FFA Foundation. And so I was their uh, PR uh, and fundraiser, PR guy and their fundraiser. And so I would always go home and help my dad whenever he, he asked me to help him. And so my dad and I were, we're extremely close. You know, I don't ever remember, how many of you remember being teenagers? Like some of you is a really long time ago. There's no question about that, right? But, but you know, you always hear this stuff. And I always have people tell me about my boys. They say, well, you just wait until they're teenagers. They'll hate you. And I just never remember, like, honestly going through that stage. I never remember that. I, I, I remember hearing that that would be what happened, but, but I just considered my parents to be my best friends. They were who I talked to about everything. 
We just had an open relationship. It was really great. And so I'll never forget this day. My dad, my dad called me and asked me to come home and work cattle. Um, we were weaning, and he just needed some help. And so I went home, and I, I, I always remember, it was November 4th, 1999. And we were working our cattle, and I was filling a vaccine gun. And I turned around, and my dad was lying in the calf alley. And I jumped the fence, and I, I put my arm under his head, and I kneeled next to him, and like, you know, it's, I said, it's going to be okay. Just what happened? What's going on? And his face started to turn blue. And I hollered at his cousin, and we, we took him, and we drug him out into the open, and we started CPR. And I remember giving my dad chest compressions. And I remember that it didn't even seem like it was a moment that was even happening. It didn't seem real. Like everything that, that he and I had talked about with what the future was for me, for our operation, for, for all of this stuff that had gone on in our family for the previous hundred years, it was like, it was, it was like I knew that it wasn't going to happen anymore. And, and we continued to do CPR on my dad with no response. And then the paramedics got there. And they continued to do CPR. And I remember at one point, the paramedics, two of them, sat up and just looked at me. And I remember screaming to them and saying, you can't, what are you doing? You can't stop. You've got you've to try at least. And the look in their eye just said everything. And that night in the hospital, was undoubtedly the longest night of my life. And the next day, after consulting with the doctor, my mom and my sister and I decided that we would pull my dad off of life support. They said he was probably gone before he hit the ground. I was 26. He was 58. And I didn't think that I could actually go on because he was everything to me. My future was, was what he and I had talked about, that we were gonna do all of these things together. And now it was gone. And now my life's changed forever. And what do I do? And over the coming weeks and the coming months, I remember driving to the ranch. I was living in Cheyenne. I was driving 50 miles to the ranch. And I remember stopping before I pulled onto the gravel road because I was, was crying so much because I couldn't stand to go back there. And I thought, what am I gonna do? I gotta gather myself. I gotta figure this out. I can't, I can't even show up and work because I got all this pain and all this stuff going on inside. And so over the, the coming weeks and months, I found myself in business with my dad's cousins and my grandfather. And this tree that I talked about a minute ago, it was very, very clear that the two sides of the tree and the different branches were more divisive than I had ever imagined. That the people that I grew up with on that ranch weren't actually who I thought they were. Because now, because my dad was the hub of the operation, now the, everyone else found this opportunity that they could hop in and they could gain control. You ever been in a family situation like that? If you've been in agriculture, you have, right? Absolutely. And so it was extremely difficult that, that I knew it, was, it was obvious to me that there was no way that this could work over the long haul. I remember that my grandpa got really sick. And, and at the time, I had gone back to school to finish, and I was going to Laramie 50 miles west, and I was driving all the way 100 miles back to the ranch every single day. And I was trying to manage all of my ranch responsibilities, and I was trying to manage my new wife, who I wasn't even engaged to when, uh, when my dad passed away, and, and trying to manage my grandparents, who were extremely sick, and I was having to feed my grandpa and change him and do all of this stuff. And, and I remember my, da my, my, my dad's cousins, my grandfather's nephews, pulling me aside and saying, you taking care of your grandpa is taking a lot of time away from this ranch. You know, if I were you, I'd forget about your grandpa. He never did any good for anyone around here. 
He was the man that made sure that when their dad passed away, that they could come back. And so as time began to unfold over a period of a couple of years, I was presented with more problems. And it was obvious to me that this was not a healthy, long-term solution for me or my marriage or my family. And so after a lot of consulting and a lot of tears and a lot of heartache and a lot of struggle, I committed the ultimate sin in agriculture and I broke up the family ranch. It's not something that you take lightly when it's been in your family for as long as ours had been. I love this quote. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And I remember my wife and I having that discussion. And we said, maybe it's us. Maybe we're the ones that can't get along with anyone. Maybe we're the ones that just have an improper perspective. Maybe it's our problem. And we tried to approach it differently. And it was just really obvious that it just flat wasn't going to work. It was like mixing oil and water. So when I left, I struggled about that. Because I knew that if I left, I was going to lose a lot. Because there was a glitch in our family estate plan when my dad passed away because he passed away out of order. Because the way they had it structured is that grandpa will go first and then, you know, nephew will go next. My dad passed away out of order. So what happened to me is that if I stayed there, I knew that eventually, because of the types of shares that we had on that, on that range, that I would eventually own 100% of the management control of that property. But if I left, not only would I lose all of that, but I would also lose a major portion of what I owned if I were to just stay. But I left anyway. And the reason that I left is because I don't think sitting around and waiting, waiting for people to die is a good estate plan. I don't think that's a good retirement plan. I don't think it's a good way to live our lives, but that's what we do in agriculture. Well, this is what grandpa did. This is what dad did, so this is, this is what we're gonna do. And I don't like it, but this is what we're gonna do. And so when I left, as you might imagine, in a town of 120 people, People think they know what they're talking about. They think they know everything that happened inside. The family thinks they know what happened. And so I ended up with my grandparents' place that was falling down. And I ended up with a little bit of farm ground. I had equipment, just a few pieces from the 1960s that I had on my place. And I had never farmed an acre of anything in my life. Because whenever my dad said to do something, it was, you know, go cut this piece of hay. You know, and I ran an old 1960s Massey Ferguson 510 combine when I was growing up. And that was what I was accustomed to. But I never planted an acre of anything. I certainly didn't understand the process from start to finish. And so we set out to farm on our own. We're going to make it. We can do this. And after four years of losing almost everything that we had, we came to another roadblock. So I had decided that we couldn't make it. We just couldn't make it on the land that we had. We you know, had a couple of little boys at that time, and we just knew that there was no way that this whole, whole thing was gonna work. So I decided, well, I'll go back to school and I'll get a teaching degree, because I can at least farm our little bit of ground in the summertime, and I'll teach the rest of the year. Except when I started with my teaching degree, I remember coming home and telling my wife, if we have one more class and I have to write one more paper about me sharing my feelings, I think someone's going to get hurt. And so at that time, I decided, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to pursue that because that's not going to create happiness for me either. But what I am going to do is I'm going to look at my own operation as a business. I'm not going to look at it as an area. I'm not going to look at it in the fact that this is what dad had, this is what grandpa had, this is what great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother had. I'm going to look at it in the fact that this is what Ron and Julie want. This is what we want out of our lives. This is, this is, this is the business that we want to create for ourselves. 
And so what we ended up doing is we ended up looking at all of our assets. And if they didn't produce a return on our investment, then we got rid of them. So as you know, it's not easy finding farmland, right? And it's especially hard to find farmland that's within a reasonable distance of your center of operation. But we were pretty blessed. So we sold off over 85% of everything that we owned and we set out to start over and rebuild. And that's what we did. And we built a farm in the last 10 years that started at 800 acres. We farm over 8,000 acres. We've invested in the cattle. We have another 6,000 acres that we run the cattle on, on grass that we own and grass that we lease. We have updated all of our equipment. We have updated all of our facilities. We have added grain storage facilities. And we've done all of that, not because we're great, but because we took something that we had and turned it into something that would work for us. And the reason that I tell you all that story and the significance of that story is this. We discovered the organic business, and it's the only reason that we were able to grow our farm the way that we have. <coughs> because for the first time in my family's history, we were able to figure out how to make a property or how to make a profit on our property in godforsaken, sometimes southeastern Wyoming. We're on the fringe of should you even be farming that property or not? But we can do a pretty good job with it. And so, so we've, we've changed everything that we do. We use, we're a modernized farm now. And we have, we have taken our facilities. And if you go to our website, um, rainbowfarms.com, you'll see on there that we, one of the things that we offer is on-farm experiences. Because I think it is incredibly important to share with our certifiers, with our buyers, and with the consumer about what an organic farm really is. So we've taken old buildings that were literally moving in the wind, and we, we fixed them. Instead of tearing them down, we fixed them. And we added a guest lodge, and we added a commercial kitchen, and we added an office, and we added a, 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 a bar and pool room, a guest lounge. We updated all of our shops, our equipment, everything. But we did that because I really believe that we should build our business as farmers, especially as organic farmers, around the consumer. We live in a world now where consumers are more in touch with their food than they ever have been. And whenever they have a question about anything, what do, what do you do now when you have a question? Unless you're my mother. My mother still looks in the encyclopedia. Okay? Yeah, you go to Google, right? So we live in a society for the first time ever that will never have to wonder what the answer is to any question that they have. Because it's at our fingertips. We've all got it in our pocket, right? It's all there. <clears throat> Here's what I discovered. I discovered that it's hard to focus on getting better and improving the land and improving your practices and all that you do in your operation if there's no money to be made and there's a constant economic struggle. And that's where our family was. We were constantly struggling all the time. So where does your focus go? Oh, we, I just got to hope that we can make it this year. I, I, just, I just hope that, uh, you know, our kids can find a scholarship because we don't have any money to send them to school. For our operation, as I already said, the organic industry is the only reason we've been able to rebuild and make things better because we found a different way to do things. This is my grandparents' uh, original place, and that is our farm. And we left the family ranch 15 years ago. And as I said, we struggled for four years, and then we finally decided to start rebuilding and changing things. 
And this is a picture of the same place today. And this is what we've changed. And so we've used a lot of initiatives through the farm programs to help build our place and, uh, and, and improve things. But you know, I think that there are <clears throat> some challenges and some concerns that we all need to pay attention to in the organic business. I think it's important to understand that every single one of you in here has a story, right? I just told you my story, some of it, right? You all have a story too. A lot of yours is way more dramatic than mine is because we all have stuff. But I think it's important to remember and keep the perspective that when there's, when there's all the paperwork that we have to do as certifiers or as producers, and there's all of the red tape that we have to flow through, it's important to remember that farms are not just built overnight, but they're built over generations of time. That, that American farmers take a tremendous amount of pride in what they do and how they do it. And I think it's extremely important to keep in mind the commitment and the investment that farmers have in their own operations. Ours, I think, is a prime example. So you all know this, but I just pulled this out just for uh, easy math here. Let's look at this, just as an example. Okay, land where I'm at isn't as expensive, obviously, as land where you all are from. Okay, so we can buy farmland, dry land farm, farm ground where we're at, roughly around $1,200 an acre. Well, if you have a 1,000 acre operation, that's 1.2 million. Let's say you buy a bunch of used equipment, now you've got another half a million on top of that. Your storage facilities, your operation facilities, your annual operating expenses, and now pretty soon you've got over a couple of million dollars in a small thousand acre operation which would not provide for a family where I'm at. It's just not enough ground. It's not enough at all because you can't produce enough off of it. And that doesn't include any kind of a revenue stream or any kind of a profit or any kind of wages or anything like that. So I think it's important that we are mindful as consumers and particularly as certifiers and as buyers that no one is going to take a $2 million investment or five or $10 million investment and throw it down the toilet. They're not going to try to, to uh, to not do the best they can with that, okay? And I wanna address that here in a minute because I think that it's important that, that we keep a proper perspective. That's all I'm saying, is that when we're dealing with people that have this kind of investment, it's not just time, it's not just legacy, it's not just history, it's not just that. It's the financial investment as well. So what's important? I think, that there's nothing more important on this planet than the value of relationships. And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the value of relationships between producers and certifiers, between producers and buyers, between producers, certifi uh, cert uh, producers, certifiers, processors, manufacturers, and the consumer. Because like I said, the consumer's more in touch than they ever have been. But relationships are important. Open communication is important. I can only speak to what I know, and I know our area of the country pretty well. That there's a lot of guys that live where we do, much like you were talking earlier, about the fact that they think that their certifiers are out to get them that the inspectors are gonna show up and they're gonna find something and it's gonna put them out of business. Because they're on the edge, even with the organic markets. Daryl and I were talking about this this morning, that in our neck of the woods, even with the organic markets, there's not a lot of profit there where we're at. Because the production levels are just not there. So my point is, is that 
people in our area are not going to take a two or four or five or six or eight or ten million dollar investment and not do what they're supposed to do because their very dependence on their life and their business is dependent upon them being able to sell in this niche market. But in the form of relationships, how much time do we spend I'm not talking just as certification agencies, I'm talking about in life in general. How much time do we spend building actual relationships with the people that we work with? Would it be helpful, for an example, if the national organization came to your chapter and said, look, we're all on the same team here. We really appreciate you guys, and we understand what you do. These are obviously the rules and the guidelines that we have to follow, and here's why we have to follow them. But we're not out to get you. We're here, we're all on the same team. It's important that we have that conversation. But there's so many guys in my area that are so paranoid of the fact that, you know, I'm gonna get some guy from the East Coast, he's gonna, he's gonna come out to my place and he's gonna look at it, and he's not gonna understand what we're gonna do and we're gonna lose it all. And I'm telling you, it's a major concern, isn't it? It's exactly what you're It's exactly the conversation. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a real thing. But we're, the, the problem is, is we're not talking about it. We're, not, we're talking about it in pockets, but we're not engaging it as organizations and people who work with each other. If you don't have a relationship with the people that you work with, and a mode of open communication, there's no trust. And if there's no trust, there's nothing. If we can't trust each other, then there's nothing. That's why we said on our farm, and not everyone can do this, but this is why we said on our farm, come to our farm, live with us, see what we do. Then, maybe you can get a little bit better perspective. What's this picture? Yesterday? yesterday? Yes. <laughs> well, I, if I was on a tractor yesterday, I was in the wrong place. <laughs> That's me planting wheat on a September day and there was no wind. That's what it looks like where I live. The soil that we have, I'm telling you, is nothing compared to what it is here. It is nothing. All I can say is thank goodness for technology, right? Because the tractor can drive itself. <laughs> Otherwise, you would not, you know, I mean, we used to have all kinds of big skips because you can't see where you're going. <clears throat> and here's my point. There is absolutely, in my mind, no one-size-fits-all formula because we all live in different places. And we all have a lot of different challenges that we face. We all have a lot of different issues that we're trying to overcome, but I'll speak to the ones that I know the best. We have some challenges where we farm. One is precipitation. We have an annual precipitation rate of 14 inches a year. Most of that falls from October through April in the form of horizontal snowstorms. Okay, if you don't know what a horizontal snowstorm is, it's when the, the snow comes down like this, and when it hits Wyoming, it goes like this because of the wind. And it piles up in our tree rows, and it piles up in our buildings, and then it turns black. Because even with a lot of cover on the ground, the dirt still blows. The very first picture that I showed you about the farming mecca of Wyoming, those are my fields. That day, the wind was, we had wind gusts of 93 miles an hour. How do you hold anything down at 93 miles an hour? It's not unusual to close the interstates in Wyoming because it's blowing the trucks over when they're driving down the, the, uh, the interstates. It's just, the way, it's just where we live. Elevation is another factor. We farm at over 5,300 feet elevation. It changes a lot of stuff. 
We have some warm days. We have really cool nights. So it'll be 90 during the day. It'll get down to the 50s at night. It never stays warm at night. I remember sleeping outside when I was growing up in our backyard in July, and you always had to wear a stocking cap because you would freeze your head off, right? I remember on the 4th of July, twice when I was growing up, and it snowed when we were trying to do fireworks. That is a really big bummer when you're 10 years old and you're all excited with all your fireworks, and then here comes a snowstorm on the 4th of July. This year, I uh, uh, went on, I was in a, at a hunt in uh, uh, Florida, and I got home, and when I drove into my yard, it was the 17th of August, and it was 44 degrees. We have a lot of challenges. The wind, we already talked about that. In our area, Darren and I talked about it this morning, we have to fallow ground. And I know that this is a big, big, big issue with NOP regulations and with certifiers. You can't have fallow ground. I am telling you here today, we cannot grow crops in Wyoming if we don't fallow the ground, period. Because you have to have moisture if you're going to utilize cover crops and you're going to utilize uh, fertility programs. You gotta have the moisture that goes along with it. Last year before I planted my wheat, we went 90 plus days with no measurable rain. And you can imagine what that does. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have anything growing or not, it just destroys it. So there's no one program that fits everything. And I, I get it, I understand that there's there's rules, there's regulations, there's all these things that we have to follow. But this, this isn't a cookie cutter. What works here in this part of Iowa or Wisconsin or Illinois doesn't work in Wyoming. It's just a different world. And so I think that we have to learn to be flexible and to understand but my point is, is that if you don't have good relationships with the people that you work with, how do you know this? The only thing that you can look at is say, well, this is what the rules say and this is what we're supposed to do. Except, there's always exceptions, right? And we have to, we have to learn to build those relationships so we understand the different parts of the country and the different people that we work with. So I'm here to tell you that in our location, the right kind of management can make a difference. That's, again, why relationships are important. If you know that you're working with farmers who are putting their best effort forward, would that make a difference? Would it make a difference to your guys in South Dakota that if the national organization had a relationship with those guys and knew that they were putting their best effort forward. And there are guys, by the way, that aren't putting their best effort forward. And quite frankly, I think they need to be, you know, kicked out. Because we have guys around us that are raising lots and lots and lots of wheat. And it's 5% protein, literally. And it's full of weeds. Well, you're not doing your job. You're not, doing, you're not putting your best effort forward. That's what we have to look out for. But you don't even know that if you don't have a relationship, right? That, 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 that method of communication has to be, there's a lot of guys that are afraid to even call their certifiers, no matter who they are, because they're afraid that their certifiers are, someone said it earlier, are gonna put them in jail. Like really, I mean, that's, that's like a big deal. I mean, you hear all these organic scams and everything going around there, and one guy gets written up for a non-compliance, and oh my God, what's gonna happen? You know, I'm gonna be in jail, I'm gonna run my farm. That's the first thing that goes to their mind is producers. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. So no one knows, and I think this is important to keep this in mind, no one knows his farm or can take better care of his farm than the farmer. Open communication and relationships. And if you know those guys, you already know that. This is a picture of one of our fields where we're planting wheat. Doesn't look like what I showed earlier, does it? We can do a good job with what we have. There's a picture of planting wheat. There's a picture of planting garbanzo beans. See, on our farm, what we've done is we've said, look, we know for sure that we don't live 
in prime farm country. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the initiative to get as many pieces of equipment as we can to accommodate for different years, different weather patterns, different crops, different tillage practices. So we've invested massive amounts of money in a variety of tillage equipment. If you walked up to my farm, you would say, dear Lord, why do you have to have all this stuff? Because every year's different. You know, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of guys in my area, including myself, that still plow. If you don't plow in an organic system every three or four years in our neck of the woods, you're going to have cheatgrass and Russian thistles running completely amok everywhere. It doesn't have to be done every year, but it's a necessary part of the system. Okay? So here's another one. These are our wheat fields. We take pride in the fact that they're clean. You know, so many people say, well, you're an organic farmer, so I bet you're enjoying farming those weeds. Not in our place. No way. Not if we can help it. This is a little bit dark, but you can see there, that is a field of garbanzo beans. So I understand what some of the requirements are, you know, nationally. And so what we've done on our farm is to take the initiative and say, we're going to try to grow some different crops. And every single one of my neighbors has told me, you can't do that here. Have you ever, have you ever heard that, right? Oh, you can't do that. That's a bad idea. We tried that several years ago. It didn't work. Really? Because we tried it and it is working. Three years in a row. And we've done really well with garbanzo beans and with green lentils and with field peas. Prosomella is another one of ours. I'm looking into two different crops right now, and we're going, to, we're going to, what we do is we experimentally grow them first. And depending on whether the weather conditions are favor, favorable or not, um, we'll grow more acres the following year if it worked, and if we can find a market for it. So this is a picture of organic garbanzo beans in the truck. And these are organic green lentils in the bin. So the point is, is that we can do the right things. But that's why the relationships are important. That's why the communication is important. Rather than, it's, than having producers have a bunch of fear, maybe we just need to have a conversation about, hey, have you ever tried this? Have you ever done this? Most of, most of producers, Jack said it best last night, if farmers were to step out and go see different farms and different places all over the country, they would have a different perspective, correct? But how many of them ever step out? Most of them are living in the tiny box that they live in, right? So sometimes maybe we have to go to them. Maybe we have to communicate that. <clears throat> this is a concern that I've been hearing about. And I think that it's dangerous for the American and Canadian, by the way, for our Canadian friends, um, to the integrity of our business. I think that our focus needs to be on United States and Canadian grown organic foods. <clears throat> I've heard nightmare stories from buyers that have opened shipping containers of products that have been shipped in organically, all the paperwork's there, that would make your eyeballs pop out. Because no one holds the producers to a higher level of integrity than the United States does. And that we have a lot of processors and a lot of manufacturers and a lot of millers that have invested millions and millions and millions of dollars into the organic business. And my belief is that we are one new story away from a shipment from wherever it came from, came into the United States, it went into the food chain on this organic product. And what happens to our business? Are we having that discussion? If we've invested as farmers, as certifiers, as millers, processors, and manufacturers, we've invested collectively billions and billions and billions of dollars into this business. Are we willing for a couple of dollars a bushel to get grain from, you know, not picking on them, India for an example, and hope that it actually has the same level 
of integrity that our product does? We need to have that conversation. And the reason that we need to have that conversation because we have to protect our industry. And how do we protect our industry? We support North American grown, American and Canadian grown products because we know that the integrity of the product is there. We know that. But if we don't unify together as one voice to support that, what happens to our industry when a news article comes out in the LA Times, and it, by the way, it doesn't even have to be factual. You know that, right? Perception's everything. So it doesn't even have to be factual for people to believe it. And what happens to our industry? What happens to your organization? What happens if it was, it was a, uh, an overseas uh, articulating agreement that you made with another country? What happens? to your organization? What happens to our industry? <clears throat> I just think that we need to think about these things. I'm not saying that we all need to run out the door and you know have conversations, but we have to start somewhere. And we have to pull our voice together. That's the problem in American agriculture right now, is that we're all, and you know this, being producers, whoever's here that, 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 that is a producer, you know that we are so fiercely independent that we are not going to uh, look out for anyone but ourselves. We're going to have one voice in American agriculture. We don't have that voice right now. We don't have a unified voice. I'm telling you, the consumer is in touch with what they eat and where it comes from. And what are we doing to make sure that we're building the communication chains and the relationships with the end user? in our business. So this is really about keeping the proper perspective. I think it's important, right? We got red tape, we got paperwork, we got rules, we got regulations, we got all that stuff. But what are we overlooking? Relationships, communication, trust, building those things, getting back to a little bit of common sense. See, we live in a world that's so complex and it's so sophisticated that sometimes the answers, by the way, when we take a quiz, are right in front of us and we can't even see them. Because it's got to be more complicated than that. It has to be. Remember the picture that I showed you earlier about the windswept plains on the farming mecca of Alvin? This is actually it. This is what it looks like behind my house. It's perspective, right? You look one way, and it looks one way, and you look another way, and it looks a different way. So the quiz. The answers that you had were simple, right? Like how many of you went when I gave you the answer? Oh, stupid. So dumb. I can't believe I didn't think of that. Right? <laughs> And it's not because I'm trying to make you feel stupid, although that is fun. <laughs> um, but it's to remind you that sometimes the answers are right there. And we get so wrapped up in all the complicated matters of the world and all of the reporting and all of the paperwork and all of that, that we're forgetting and overlooking the simple things that in my view really absolutely truly make the difference. You see, I think that the right kind of agriculture serves as a model for better agriculture in the future. I'm telling you that if you can make a farm successful in our part of the country, and you can do a good job raising what we raise, you can be successful anywhere farming. But it takes innovation. It takes creativity. It takes a willingness to be able to change and to have a different perspective. I already touched on this earlier, but no, no other nation holds their producers to a higher standard of organic integrity than the United States. And I'm telling you, we absolutely must, as an industry, industry-wide, unify as one voice. It's imperative. I beat this matter to death. Relationships matter. Communication is imperative, and trust is everything. 
Because if those three things are gone in your organization, in my organization, in anyone else's organization, your organization is done. We have to communicate to the consumer and to the American public that supporting organic agriculture means supporting rural communities. There's more and more and more people today moving out of urban America and moving into rural settings. Why do you think that is? It's a great place to raise a family. There's more peace. There's more solitude. Where do you go when you go on vacation? If you live in metropolitan New York City, do you go to metropolitan Chicago? Or do you go to upstate New York to enjoy some peace and solitude? When we go on vacation, even though we live on a farm, we love to go you know, to the mountains or to the beach where we can chill out and enjoy nature. Because rural communities, in my view, are the foundation of our country and they're the nucleus of the American family. Because if we don't intact, protect the integrity of the American family and the integrity of our rural communities, what do we have? And we have a perfect opportunity to do that as certifiers, as producers, as anyone who is involved in the organic industry. And we, as an industry, can start that movement and we can make a difference. So, thanks very much. I've appreciated being here. Would love to chat with all of you. If you would like to learn a little bit more about us, you can go there. I will tell you that we were very honored a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were in Chicago and now that you have heard a little bit of my story, um, we were chosen, I think, as one of the first organic operations ever um, by National Farm Journal Media, Media as one of three national finalists for uh, top producer of the year. And so it was a humbling honor. Certainly no one's ever been considered from Wyoming. And so uh, I think it proves to me that the organic industry is making a presence and that that is really super important. But we have to keep it together. We have to continue to work to make it better and to connect and share our message. So anyway, I'll let you get on with the rest of your meeting. Thanks very much for having me here. I really love this part of the country.